nice to see you folks uh, and welcome to worship here at Valhelvey. Looking around, I think you're all Kent faces, so you know the score. I'm looking forward to the day where I don't have to do this drill about masks and turning over the wee flip charts uh, at the front. But you know the story, so if you could just um, turn over your, your, your wee um, cards and remember the plate behind and behave yourselves on the way out. Um, everything will be in order. We do have a wee bit of good news, I think, this week, um, in as much as that the, uh, the one metre regulation um, is going to apply in church. So Alan and I will be busy on Monday. I think Alan's done a lot of the, the maths. I'll just be the grunt who helps him, uh, but kind of rejigging the church and kind of setting it out. So we can actually sit a wee bit closer together. Who knows, we might even be able to get some of these roped off pews uh, back in action again. And hopefully the numbers will swell at that point. Um, so I would encourage you to be speaking to folk about your experience of, of being in church and just let them know that it's safe and hopefully that will encourage um, a few more folk to, to come back. Some Sundays we have as many as today, maybe 20. Other times it can go up to 40 or 50 or 60 depending on who's here. But we would love to start and see more people beginning to trickle back to church. It's too easy to get out of the rhythm. And I think as your minister, that's one of my concerns, I think, going forward is how many folk have we lost uh, over the last uh, 18 months? So it's up to us, it's up to we who come to encourage folk back. Dare I say it, maybe even to bring them back uh, if we can safely car share or walk with them uh, to church. A wee announcement this morning. Um, uh, Caroline and some of the eco group have been working hard to try and tidy up the border around the new annex. They've done the side part. And on Friday the 23rd at 10 o'clock in the morning, they're going to be meeting to begin to take on some of the bits around the back of the annex. So if you're a keen gardener or you just want to get out into the fresh air, you are more than welcome to come along on Friday the 23rd at 10 o'clock. And Caroline says you have to bring your own gloves and trowels, okay? Or any other gardening implements you feel you may need as you attack the Cotone Aster around the back. Um, of the, the annex. So Friday 23rd, 10 o'clock, bring your trowels. Those I think are all our announcements, so we're going to begin our worship this morning in the words of hymn number 211, Today I Awake. Let's worship God together. <laughs>
Let's take a moment to still our hearts and minds before God as we come before him in prayer. Let us pray. This is how God loved the world. He gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. God, this morning we bless you for the promise of eternal life. The promise that your life, the life of the ages, can take root within us, bringing hope, bringing change, and bringing a future. That promise that you hold out to us reminds us that we haven't arrived yet. We are all pilgrims on the way, journeying into you and into the future that you hold for us. You are our maker. In you, we are made complete. You are our companion. In you, we find acceptance. You are our saviour. In you, we come into fullness of life. And you are our God. And from you comes everything in this world which is worthwhile and lovely and true. Lord, we know this in our heads. We can often be slow to feel it and know it in our hearts. We allow ourselves to move through the day from task to task, rarely turning our thoughts to you. And when we do stop to pray, to think, or to read, we find it hard to believe that you accept us because we know that oftentimes our faith is lukewarm or dispassionate. Lord, more than anything, we need wisdom in these things. Not the self-aggrandizement that comes with knowledge or even the experience that comes with age, We need the wisdom that comes from knowing you. The wisdom to discern what's important from what's unnecessary, what's real from what's illusory, what is right from what is subtly wrong. Lord, we need the wisdom that helps us make the small, numerous choices day by day that over a lifetime form a character. So make us wise, living God. Help us hear and obey your word, for in you is found peace, comfort and joy, and the wholeness that we were destined for. Keep us in the way that leads to life, that we might be friends and servants of your Son, Jesus Christ in whose name we make all our prayers, saying together, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory forever. Amen. Just before Jeanette comes up uh, to do our readings, a, a wee announcement I forgot to do right at the start of the service, which is to congratulate Gordon on his uh, 70th birthday and Peter Lamb earlier this week. I won't say how old Peter was, a wee bit older than 70. And Paula McKenzie, whose birthday is tomorrow. Is that right, Ian? Uh, and also, we've had two golden weddings this week. We've had Doreen and David in Potterton, and also Sandra and Robbie Ducat in uh, Potterton. So if they're watching, congratulations uh, to them on reaching that fantastic uh, milestone. Have I forgotten anyone? Is there anyone out there who's going, it's my birthday too? Well, if it is, happy birthday. But uh, some cause to celebrate there in our congregation. Jeanette, would you like to come up now uh, to do our readings this morning?
Today's first reading is from John 3, verses 16 and 17. For this is how God loved the world. He gave his one and only Son, so that everyone who believes in him will not perish, but have eternal life. God sent his Son into the world, not to judge the world, but to save the world through him. And from John chapter 17, verses 1 and 3, Jesus prays for himself. After Jesus said this, he looked towards heaven and prayed, Father, the time has come. Glorify your Son, that your Son may glorify you. For you granted him authority over all people that he might give eternal life to all those you have given him. Now this is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. Amen. Thanks, Jeanette. Uh, our next hymn is number 755, Be Still and Know, and we'll remain seated to sing this one. Let's pray together. Be still and know. Lord, we know from our reading of Scripture that in the ancient world, that word know meant more than just knowing your mind. It was a word of intimacy. It was a word of uh, relating and relationship. And this, Father, is what we seek this morning. We're not here to get our heads crammed full of stuff. We're here to have our hearts opened up and exposed to you, that we might know you better. So as we listen together, as we attend to your word, as we seek to understand, we pray that that wouldn't just be an understanding of our intellect, important though that is, but it would be a heart knowing that warms us, that keeps us um, connected, uh, anchored to you in all the storms of life, that we might know that we are 
safe, that we are seen and held and valued by the one who brought the universe into being. And that in his eyes, we have significance beyond our understanding. So hear our prayers, Lord, as we uh, come to you now in this time, because we ask all of these things in Christ's name. Art restoration is a risky business. When it goes well, we begin to see the work as the artist originally intended, as layers of dirt and discoloured varnish are carefully stripped away. When it goes badly, though, you end up with something like this famous example from a few years ago where a Spanish grandmother with no experience and apparently no skill took it upon herself to try and restore this 100-year-old fresco in her local church. Restoration is a risky business, but I guess in a way that's what I've been trying to do over the last few weeks with this very familiar text, John 3.16, taking time over it and going into the meaning of the words in the text to help us uncover more of what Jesus meant when he said them. There was a surprise right at the beginning. Many of us learned this verse as children uh, to read, for God so loved the world, which he undoubtedly does. But the actual meaning of the Greek is, this is how God loved the world. In this way, by entering the scene himself, by identifying with our lostness and fallenness, by accepting death at our sinful hands so that sin and death could finally be overcome. It's not how we would expect an almighty God to behave, but this is how he showed his love. This is the way that he did it. He gave himself to us, not anybody else. He gave himself to us in his son. And as we remembered in the second week, every act of giving hopes for and anticipates a response, even if it's just a response of gratitude. And the response that God asks of us in the light of what he's done for us is that we believe in him. And we thought in the third week that that belief is not just about believing that he exists or believing things about God. It's about placing our trust in him and looking to him as the meaning and the goal of our lives, offering our lives back to him in grateful devotion and in the service of his kingdom. To believe in that way puts us in touch with the one who saves us from our fallen human condition, which is to perish in body and in soul. And instead, we are drawn into life, the eternal life that Jesus speaks of in the final clause of John 3, 16. But what does that phrase, eternal life, mean? Once again, I think we need to do a wee bit of restoration to see the picture more clearly because we often read eternal life as a synonym for heaven and that may be partly true but I think Jesus has more in mind here when he uses those words. The Greek words that we use for eternal life and and are in the text here in John are the words zoe ionios. Zoe Ionios. And there are several words for life in Greek, because they were very good at that. Four words for love, we just have one dead. Several for life. There's bios, your physical life. There's suke, which is the, the life of the mind. And then there is zoe, which means spiritual life. Hopefully that bit is clear enough. But Ionios is a wee bit trickier, and that's the one that there's often some confusion about. Because our words eternal or everlasting, don't really do the trick. They don't really capture what the Greek is meaning because as soon as we hear them, eternal, everlasting, all we think of is time and duration. But that's not really the sense of the word. In Greek, ionios 
is more about where something originates than how long it goes on for. It's more about the quality of something than about the quantity. So eternal life isn't so much about a geographical place called heaven or a life that endures and goes on and on and on and on and on. It's about the quality of that life that God wants to bless us with. It's about a life that has its origins in eternity in the very life of God himself. If our present lives are like water, God wants us to know the life that tastes like wine. He wants us to know the life that deep down we all long for and were created for, even if we don't recognize it as having its origins in him. Because we're all hungry for this kind of life. And that might be a wee bit hard to get your heads around, but bear with me as I try and explain. If you pay attention to yourself and to the people around you, it isn't long before you start noticing what seems to be a universal truth about human beings, which is that we are wistful. We go on holiday, and it's great, but we come back a little sad that it's over, and whistle for our next trip away. Or we find ourselves reminiscing about the past and being wistful for better times and what seemed at least from the distance of a few decades to be a more simple life. The days when our bodies would do the things that we wanted them to do with less protest. Or we find ourselves dreaming about the future when we can step back from the responsibilities of the workplace and have a little more free time to do the things that we want to do with the people we love. Now that's years away for some of us, but we are undoubtedly wistful for it. Or we find ourselves feeling confined in a situation, a job or a relationship or a set of circumstances that are difficult. And we find ourselves wondering what our life might have been if we'd made other choices or things had turned out differently in our lives. What would the future have looked like, we wonder? We live in an age that's very skeptical about any claim to a universal truth, and yet here in the heart of human existence, we find just that very thing, a universal truth, and it's this. We are wistful. Every now and again, we all find ourselves wishing that things could have been better in some way. We wish that our workaday life was perhaps a bit more fulfilling or rewarding. We wish that our relationships could always be plain sailing. We wish that we could have things back the way that they were before age or illness or death crossed our threshold uninvited. And I wonder what that looks like for you this morning. It's worth spending some time over that question. And I was going to give some time in the service to do that, but I thought actually it's too important to rush. So I'd encourage you to take this away as one of your takeaways from the, from the sermon today. Take this question away and think about it at home and let that lead you into prayer. How would you finish the sentence that Ernie's just put up there? If only I could only I could. That's an expression of your wistfulness. If only I could go back in time and do things differently. If only I could get out from underneath all this responsibility that I carry. If only I could change that part of who I am. If only I could fix that person or that situation. It's worth spending time in that question. How would you finish that sentence, if only I could. And you can fill in the gap for yourself. It's a very personal thing, but I'm pretty sure that there is a gap to be filled for all of us. Because that's what it is to be human. This side of eternity, we yearn for what we don't yet have. Our hearts are restless, as Augustine was fond of saying. And that's because we were made for more than we have yet known. We were made for God, and we were made for the future for which God made us. 
We're restless. And it has always been that way. Jewish thought held that there were two eras of time, two ages. There was this age, or this present age, in which life was a constant struggle between right and wrong and good and evil. And it was this age in which we live and move and in which the story of salvation is being worked out. And then there was the age to come, an age of glory and wonder when God would finally be all in all, when evil would be put in its place and the world would become what God had always wanted it to be. So one age is characterized by longing and by lack and one by harmony and by joy, one by fragmentation and one by reconciliation. And as this diagram shows quite effectively, there is an overlap between the ages, and this is where we live. It's the time that some people have called the already, but not yet. So for example, Jesus is already Lord, but the world hasn't yet acknowledged his lordship, though one day it will. Jesus says, the kingdom is among you. It's here and it's now, but we also know that the kingdom hasn't yet fully come. That's ahead of us. And so there's something ahead of us in the age to come. And according to the scriptures, that's the age when things will get mended, when things will get fixed between us and God, between us and each other, between us and the creation. And this is what the prophets pointed to again and again. They will build houses and dwell in them, says Isaiah. They will plant vineyards and eat their fruit. No longer will they build houses and others live in them or plant and others eat. For as the days of a tree so will be the days of my people. My chosen ones will long enjoy the works of their hands. The wolf and the lamb will feed together, and the lion will eat straw like the ox, but dust will be the serpent's food. They will neither harm nor destroy on all my holy mountains, says the Lord. Isaiah there is giving us a picture, an image of life in the age to come and it sounds like a poem or a fairy tale but maybe that's the thing about fairy tales maybe they keep popping up across cultures and generations because they're an echo of a deeper truth that won't be silenced the truth that there is an age to come an age marked by the peace and joy meaning love and knowing that flow naturally when we finally experience god as our all in all. Life in the age to come, eternal life, heaven, whatever you want to call it, all boils down to one thing, knowing and relating to God as he truly is. And if you were listening carefully to this morning's reading, particularly the second one, you might have picked that up already. Because as Jesus prayed with his disciples on the night he was betrayed, he said these words that Jeanette had read to us, Father, the hour has come. Give glory to your Son, so the Son may give glory to you. For you gave him authority over all humanity, so that he might give eternal life to all those you gave him. And eternal life means knowing you, the only true God, and knowing Jesus Christ, whom you sent. Eternal life, at its simplest, is knowing God and receiving the life that he offers to us. And the twist that Jesus brings to this story is to insist that you can taste the life of the age to come now, if you want to. By the grace of God, you can bask in tomorrow's sunshine today. You don't have to wait to know eternal life. You can begin to experience it now. And all you have to do is open up to God, to trust him with your life. And then, as well as you can, develop the disciplines and the habits that will keep you close to him, keep keep his life growing inside you. Because that is what it really means to believe. It's not first and foremost about the head, it's about the heart. It's about a relationship with the living God. 
And as you begin to open your life to him, the harmony and the peace and the love of the age to come begin to flow over from the future into the now and help to transform it. A little piece of the kingdom begins to come in our lives and in our world as our perspectives and attitudes and behaviors begin to change. Our circumstances might stay the same. We might still be stuck or sad or sick or uncertain. But the way that we live with those things changes because now God's life is flowing into ours. And as we well know from the scriptures, when God touches something, things change. Water becomes wine. Despair gives way to hope. Alienation evolves into friendship. And death gets swept away on the rising tide of God's life. The life that he shares with anyone who looks to him for it. And that we can know now and not just then. This is what John 3, 16 has been telling us down all the centuries. There is life beyond, yes, but there is also life now to be lived and experienced. God's life. God's eternal life. For this is how God loved the world. He gave his one and only son so that everyone who believes in him will not perish, but have eternal life. Earlier on, when we were thinking about our own wistfulness, I asked if you could think about how you'd finish the sentence, if only I could. And I want to close this morning by praying into that for us all as we finish this time together. So let's pray now. If only, Lord, if only, Words that remind us of our powerlessness in the face of so much that happens in life. And in different ways, we all yearn for the same things, for health, for rest, for meaning, for wholeness, for joy. Sometimes we taste these things and we are full of gratitude. Sometimes the routines and responsibilities of life dull our experience of them. And sometimes the sheer scale of the things that we're dealing with seem to swallow them whole. And yet the longing remains. An echo of the blessedness that we were made for and by your grace will one day know in all its fullness. But for now, Lord, we ask for the grace to know something of your empowering life in the midst of our own. Bring calm, bring hope, bring reassurance in the places where we're feeling anxious or despondent. Bring respite and rest where we're tired and weary. Bring acceptance and resolve where we're troubled by the past. Trust and optimism where we're concerned for the future. Bring love where it's lacking. Strength where it's long since run out. And a wider vision where we felt our horizons shrinking in recent months. Good Father, we take a moment in silence now to open our hearts to your life, asking that you would meet us in our own particular places of need and minister to us there.
Lord who loves, who gives of himself, and who saves. May your light shine in our darkness, and may the seeds of your eternal life take root within us and bear fruit even now for the sake of your kingdom and your glory. We're going to sing together now, and it's hymn number 567, Focus My Eyes on You, O Lord. Ian McKenzie is going to lead us now in our prayers for others. God is near to all who call on him. He listens when we pray. So let's bring our prayers to God with confidence, knowing that he will hear and answer. So let us join in prayer. Heavenly Father, we take time out of our busy lives to come before you this day and to offer you praise and thanks. We thank you for this day and all the days of our lives. We thank you for the world in which we live and do not always fully appreciate or care for properly. We pray for the people of Germany and Belgium who have suffered losses of life, family and homes in the tragic floods this week. Be with them as they try to rebuild their lives from this disaster during the coronavirus pandemic. We pray for thousands of orphan children in Afghanistan and Africa who are struggling to live in those war-torn countries. We pray for those whose daily need for food, clean water and proper shelter goes unmet. And for those misusing what they have in the vain pursuit of pleasure. Fill them with a sense of justice and fairness that they might stand firm in the right to a decent life for all people now. 
We pray for those whose lives have been broken by violence and crime, conflict and struggle. Fill them with courage and anticipation of a life beyond the barriers which hold them back. We pray for those who are sick or grieving and those who care and look after them. We especially include those we know personally who are facing difficulty at this time who we name to you in a moment of silence. Fill them with your healing presence and remind them of your promises. We pray for those who have lost faith in themselves and in you and who struggle to find meaning in life. Help them to focus their eyes on you, Lord, and give them hope for a new day. Father, help us love our neighbour as ourselves, especially those who are different from us and even those we least like. Help us to treat them as we would want to be treated, with love, care, respect and honour. We pray that by loving our neighbour as ourselves, would change how we treat refugees and immigrants and put an end to the increasing racial abuse. We pray for our own politicians and leaders and ask you to guide them to the correct decisions for all our futures. We thank you for the leadership skills you have given Paul, our minister, and the ability to put them to use here in Mulhelmi. We thank you for the support he gets from Rona and the family. Help us to use the gifts and talents you have given us to support Paul. Lord, hear these and all our silent prayers, because we offer them in the name of Jesus Christ, to whom we lift our eyes in hope, our hearts in faith, and our voices in prayer. Amen. Same. We're going to conclude our worship this morning in the words of hymn number 519, Love Divine, All Loves Excelling.
now go in peace to love and to serve the Lord. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be with you all, now and forever. Thank you.